John Deniker. Hi, John. Thanks for joining us. How, John, let me ask you, how big is your business? I had 20 employees. 20 employees? Okay. Well, what we're hoping to drive through the creation of the insurance exchange. Now, these are, these are, these are private insurance companies. This isn't a public program. This isn't a government-run program. It's just insurance exchange. It's an organization called the National Saskatchewan Door Jobbers Association. It's across the nation. That's where my insurance was approved, through a national organization. And I would still be able to reduce it 30 to 40%. You get rid of the mandates. Get rid of the stuff that government yeah. tells me I have to do. Well, you got to take that up with, your, with the state because the states are the ones that determine minimum benefit packages, what is going to be covered or what isn't going to be covered. And, and that has been a problem because the states do different things in that regard. But, you know, you got to talk to your state legislators who are passing the mandates, uh, such as uh, paternal care, I mean, such as maternity care, such as child care, things of this nature, cancer screening, those are some of the mandates uh, that they've been coming up with at the state level. And if you get into the individual basis of them, you can imagine how, how uh, tricky this becomes. Thanks, John. Good to, good to hear from you. Thanks for coming again. Kelly Holzer? Kelly here? Hi, Kelly. Hi. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming today. Yep. Um, Yeah, I'd be happy to count. Kelly was wondering, how, how does Wall Street reform really impact us here back home on the main streets and in our communities? A couple of things. First of all, if these banks, these large banks, want to take unreasonable bets and they get themselves into trouble, they will go down. They won't be bailed out uh, in the future. We ha finally have the tools that didn't exist a year and a half ago, and that is to dissolve these large institutions in an orderly fashion so it doesn't jeopardize, jeopardize the entire financial market, including Main Streets uh, here in western Wisconsin. And we're finally creating this Consumer Financial Protection Agency whose sole function is to keep an eye on these financial products that are being sold to us, whether the mortgages, credit cards, 401ks, you know, uh, savings opportunities, things of this nature. No one else was in charge of keeping an eye on that. And because of it, you had the subprime mortgages that were being handed out to anyone uh, without them realizing that the rates were going to adjust and they were going to get caught holding the bag, which really precipitated the whole housing crisis that we just went through. So having that. And then just bringing greater transparency to these fancy financial products, you know, these derivatives and hedge funds and that, all of which have been operating in the shadows, not over the counter, not in exchanges, bringing them into the sunshine so that finally people can take a look and see what they're all about. I think it's going to uh, help bring clarity to, to all this that got us into this, 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 this trouble to begin with. So those are just some of the functions uh, that we have, including some credit card reform. Again, excessive fee increases, interest rate increases that they could do at a moment's notice, whether you had good credit or not, uh, and making sure that people aren't being taken advantage of in that regard. Thank you, Kelly. Good to hear from you. Uh, Peter Muto. Peter here? Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Layoff of 
300,000 public school teachers across the nation. First off, let me uh, thank you, sir, for voting for the appropriation to fund the war, the surge of 30,000 troops in Afghanistan. They cost $1,200,000 Mm. And you have the courage and uh, patriotism to see that through. How come I got a short change on that? <laughs> Did you? That was, that's pretty, pretty fast, huh? <laughs> so, I want to talk about the 300,000 teachers. For uh, $1,200,000 per soldier, you can hire half a platoon of teachers. Yeah. Put them in the classroom where with tender loving care they can help us to develop the citizens of the future who will have in their hearts the patriotism and the courage and the health and clean uh, police records so they can become members of the armed services <laughs> to fight for a country that's worth fighting for. That's right. Peter, thank you. Thank you for your, your comments and thanks for being here. Uh, Peter was wondering about you know, the, the support for the funding for Afghanistan and, and, and Iraq. And, and I've always believed, and listen, Western Wisconsin, our state, has made our fair share of sending troops uh, overseas in support of these missions. And they've done an incredible job. I mean, nothing has made me proud to be an American than the times I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan, visiting with our troops on the ground and seeing the job that they are doing. They're well-trained, they're well-motivated, they're literally the best we have to offer. And we also know that when a troop deploys, the whole family deploys. It is a major sacrifice for the family, the community, not just that individual soldier. But I always believe that if they're going to be in harm's way, and we need to give them the tools and the resources to do their job as safely and as effectively as possible, while we continue to focus on the policy and trying to get the policy right. And this is hard, and this is not easy in Afghanistan. I mean, they start at such a low level. And my concerns with what's happening over there are on a number of fronts. I don't know if we have a legitimate partner in the Karzai government, given the corrupt nature that exists over there. I don't know if we can adequately train your Afghan security and police forces so that they can take over the security operations. They have a high illiteracy rate, and they're not easy to train. And I don't know if Pakistan is going to do a better job of, of, of controlling the western provinces, where there are safe havens today for Taliban and al-Qaeda to operate. And we could do everything right in Afghanistan. But if Pakistan doesn't get it right on their side, it's not going to matter. But I'm also concerned what happens if we turn our back from that region, as we've done in the past, right away. And whether Taliban comes in and takes over, and Al-Qaeda will be in there establishing training camps, and then we're back to pre-9-11 uh, again. And these are tough calls, but I'm glad that the president is always asking the question of where the exit ramps are. And we have to continue to ask that because nothing could be easier for us to get dragged into an open-ended, endless commitment in a place like Afghanistan. So we've got to have metrics and objectives and goals in place uh, to see whether we're reaching them or not. And then how do we extricate ourselves? How do I, we get ourselves out of that situation? And that's what the president's been focused on uh, as well. So, and in, in regards to the teachers, you know, Unfortunately, our kids just can't wait for an economic recovery before they get a good education. It's just that simple. And we try to correct that through a, a bill that you cited, Peter, but we paid for it too. It wouldn't add a nickel to the deficit. We found offsets in the budget to pay for that so that we, didn't, we wouldn't see 300,000 teachers lose their jobs and, and the effect that was going to have on, on the education of our kids. More work needs to be done, though. Thank you. It's good to hear from you.